my name is Cherry, and that's Bush down there. Um, and I'm a kernel programmer, and I normally talk about mm, parallel instruction sets and uh, hardware gates. And Santosh likes to think of himself as an unprofessional gamer. Uh, I don't write a single line of JavaScript. What am I doing at a JavaScript conference? Well, it happens to be the case that we're both engineers. We think we've got degrees. Um, and we also like to think that we like to program and solve problems. And we both happen to use this device. So that's what um, brings us to a JavaScript conference in the context of a mobile phone. Now, what is the problem that I, as a user of Emacs, mostly, and the keyboard, found when I was using my mobile phone? Well, to understand this, you have to understand how the brain works a little bit. And I have a very basic uh, uh, background in neuroscience. So I'll talk to you about episodic memory. Uh, episodic memory is any memory, basically, that uh, you have a sequential memory of. So I went to Commercial Street, and then I stopped at the corner, and then a bike knocked me down, and then I got up, and oh, there was that interesting person there that I wanted to meet last week, and so on and so forth. So you can remember these things in sequence. Um, normally, episodic memory is in the context of me. Uh, if you played uh, first-person first shooter games uh, or things like that, you remember it from your point of view. Uh, so they're normally autobiographical. Um, uh, episodic memory is not uh, limited to human beings. Animals are demonstrated to have them as well. Um, uh, for humans, uh, times, places, uh, associated emotions, um, who you were with, a lot of things that you can explicitly state in a narrative. Uh, that's what uh, episodic memory uh, you know, can be described as. What you wouldn't remember is um, you know, how many times you were at, at a place, uh, what were the, you know, the car plate numbers, Imagine you were walking down the street. I just pulled this off the web from somewhere, but it's intended to be a crowded street that you can't remember too much about. And you're down this street. What can you remember? Um, you know, could you remember landmarks? Could you remember that particular telephone pole that you maybe locked your bike on? Uh, could you remember what you ate? You ate your favorite food. Uh, you met uh, someone interesting. You can remember people. Uh, what would you not remember? Do you remember the exact date? This was a year ago. Do you remember what date you were on uh, at that place? Maybe not. Um, do you remember the names of all the shops in sequence that you walked down that street? Probably not. Um, so episodic memory and uh, sort, of um, sort of the other types of memory that you, you, know, you, you coach yourself to remember um, are sort of, they work differently. And what does this have to do with mobile phones? Well, this is what happens to my mobile phone when I go over the weekend and come back and turn my phone on. You know, I've got 157 new messages and so on and so forth. Now, the problem is, if I click on any one of those buttons, it's going to open up that many messages. I'm going to have to scroll through it. I'm going to have to read through every single message. The cognitive load is higher. You have to uh, basically, uh, in many cases, respond, read and respond. So, for example, in the real world, if you're walking down a street, you could probably remember things while you were driving. Try doing that when you're reading the contents of your mobile phone. So it's cognitively more expensive. Right? You probably don't want to do that. I'm not giving you that advice. Please don't do that. Um, so, uh, so this is to say that um, the mobile phone, the modern mobile phone, uh, if you want to use it in social ways, is very interruptive. You get these WhatsApp group messages at 1 a.m. that you know, wakes you out of your sleep. Uh, it's really interruptive. And in many cases, people don't use the notifications anymore. They just like put it on quiet or just swipe it out and then go and check back later. Um, and that's OK, except what if you had a critical message in there, right? So if you had um, a message that uh, you know, your mom sent you uh, asking for uh, you know, uh, the number of somebody uh, quite urgently at 1 in the morning, maybe that's really important. Maybe you should have read that notification, right? So how, you know, this is a problem, right? And I mean, look at, look at this. This is, this is human sent messages. And now look at this. Pizza offers, uh, PNR numbers on the IRCTC train. I mean, how many of us have been on the train and the, the conductor comes up and asks for your number and you're like, oh, sorry, sir, one minute, let me check. You know, it's really hard. You have to 
the, the interface is pretty broken, unless you use something like Exigo and so on and so forth, but we'll come on to that in a minute. So, we're all programmers. I'm hoping that we write JavaScript. Um, and hopefully we have a problem-solving mindset. We want to you know, crack some interesting problems. The problem here is that we want to use the same machine. Um, you know, when I was in college, a machine of this power would be very expensive and probably fill quite a big room. Um, you know, you want to apply this machine to go through your data and organize it for you in interesting ways without losing access to critical information, without losing that emergency call from your mom. Right? So, that is the problem that we were trying uh, to look at. It really irked us, and uh, maybe we had a lot of time on our hands, but we were trying to solve this problem, and we came up with decant. Uh, now, in, in the Western world, if you say decant, normally people say wine. Uh, in India, normally people say coffee. It doesn't matter what your favorite drink is. But basically, the idea is that you have a vessel full of stuff. Some of it you like, some of it you don't. And you want to carefully pour it out into another smaller vessel. And the smaller vessel will then hopefully have more useful uh, information in it. Um, this is what your PNR numbers would look like uh, you know, when your train uh, conductor is coming to have a look. Uh, at your tickets. Now, this is one way of doing it. Uh, and your pizza codes, you know, um, so, you know, what, what are the offers like? These are not sorted, by the way. This is very rough and ready proof of concept kind of stuff. Uh, but the idea, what, what we want to talk about is how do we organize this information in a way in which I have control over the data that comes into my phone, right? That's the problem that we're trying to solve here. Um, so, um, so this is this is one way to look at it. Now, now, apart from the notification problem, you also have the problem of search. So I've got this information now, and I want to look up uh, information that was in my phone. That you know, somebody sent me an in interesting text message about an interesting thing six months ago. I want to look it up. Hang on a minute. That's going to be a lot of scrolling on your phone. Um, so I want to you know look it up. Uh, and I don't even remember whether it was on WhatsApp or Telegram or SMS. I can't remember this stuff. How do I do this, right? So that's, and the problem is compounded by the fact that these private applications do not talk to each other. The databases are not common, and they cannot be common. Um, so this is problematic, both from a programming and from a usability point of view. Um, now, what we looked at at SMS, because that's where we started. That's, you know, I don't use any social media except for Twitter now because I'm required to. But anyway, um, but SMS was a good starting point. And uh, basically, we said, how do we structure this thing? So if you want to have a look at the code, uh, have a look there. And there's, a, uh, there's an easy way to do that later on. Uh, now, what is the solution? Well, we thought, why not apply the most popular language out there? JavaScript runs on every damn computer today. It runs on your browser. It runs on your phone. It runs on your IoT. It runs on like everything, basically. And why not get people to write their filter applications, the applications where they want to look at this uh, data? Uh, why don't we use that language to do this, to solve this problem? And second, there are no rules. A bunch of engineers in, app, uh, in uh, you know, whatever company that sells your mobile phone cannot d dictate the rules on how you should use your own data. That data belongs to me. I would like to use, you know, break the rules. There are no rules in this game. Um, and where do you start? Well, the notification system is where you start because every single application on your phone talks to the notification system. Good stuff. Right. Now, how do we break the problem of having different silos of application not talking to each other? Well, this is where the case of the current ecosystem comes into play. So Exigo, you know, for, for example, is a really good application. You can look at your PNR numbers and then you can get live information of trains uh, running and then it can put it together in its own interface. Now, what if the SMS format changed? What if you were looking at email? What if you were looking at human content? Right? So every single data source has its own unique format and its own unique statistical um, layout. This is where the plugin writer can decide, I'm going to own PNR numbers. I'm going to own uh, email. I'm going to own pizza offers, and so on and so forth. So there's an ecosystem of application developers writing plugins, pretty much like you would for Mozilla, um, Firefox, where you'd have uh, you know, plugins do this stuff. Here's an example if you were uh, keen on pizza. Um, so, you know, you can have a better look at what's up today. Now, JavaScript. I am not a JavaScript programmer. The JavaScript programmers don't write down there. 
but it's pretty self-evident. It's fairly simple. This is like version 0.001 of the API. There's no API yet. What we're playing with this, a uh, bunch of functions, very self-explanatory. Have a look at the code. Uh, it's an advanced stock, so there's no spoon feeding. But let's have a look at the, um, the, the, the application in action. So uh, these are my default messages. No, I'm lying. It's not my phone. Uh, so what we're going to do is to start the, this is the developer interface for DCAN. Obviously, you know, it's not user ready yet. No one's going to use this thing at, uh, at this point. What we want to do is to generate SMSs so that basically you don't have to pay uh, for every SMS that you have to test. That would be a very expensive testing platform. So you want to generate your own template tests and that's what the screen essentially does. Um, so uh, hopefully at this point, uh, you know, would have generated a bunch of, uh, yeah, pizza spam email, so there we, uh, SMS, so there we go, there's a whole bunch of pizza spam uh, SMSs in your inbox, right? Now, I do not want to look at this stuff. I want to look at it uh, in a more interesting way. Now, notice that there's a bunch of plugins over there. We actually have written three uh, simple ones to start with, and, you know, hopefully there'll be more coming along the way. Uh, now, uh, what the, the information that we're looking for is from Domino. So let's have a look at what Domino, uh, you know, uh, is looking like. Well, you know, you've got the offer type, uh, and so on. There's a bunch of tags over there, and you've got uh, the columns that list. This is horrible. I hope I'm not offending any UI designers sitting in here. But, you know, this is a start. This is, you know, this is how it starts. Uh, you know, large, large, large projects have started at, uh, you know, very small, interesting places. But the cool thing is that you can play with this thing. Um, all you need to do is have the application running, and then you can just write JavaScript code, bung it into a directory, and it's ready to roll. Um, so, that's essentially the, the, the run-through uh, for DCAN, right? Now, um, now, let's get back to the episodic memory problem. Here I want to digress a little bit, and I think I ran a bit faster than I initially intended to. But really, um, what we're showing here is just the first step of a huge number of possibilities. Ideally, you want to see something, uh, you know, you want, you want to be able to access information uh, by describing it in very simple ways. Look at these keywords over here, shop, commercial street, cuddly toy. What if you wanted to find that shop on commercial street with the cuddly toy you noticed when you were snacking on your favorite snack and not trying to drop, you know, your armful of shopping? So you don't remember the date, you don't, you know, there's a load of other things that you don't remember, but you want to do this. Well, everyone's now going to say, word to vec, word to vec. Uh, yeah, you can use NLP if you like. Great. Uh, the possibilities are endless. The point is, we want to start doing this in a way in which we as programmers have access and control to our information. Um, and hopefully, uh, you know, this could develop into something more for, you know, the, the developers. So it's an ecosystem possibility. I've run this through uh, people from around the world. I just returned from an overseas trip and people are really excited to see this stuff. Uh, you know, there is value in it, um, and there's potential in running this. Maybe not in this form, maybe not decant, but the pattern is definitely valid. So if anyone of you around here wants to start a company, this is a group, you know, it's something interesting to look at. Um, I'm not running a company, by the way. Um, what next? So, um, we do not have a roadmap. This is a couple of guys sitting together and writing some code, right? Or at least one guy writing some code and the other guy basically telling him, well, I like that and not like this, right? Um, you want to write your own plugins, maybe, you know, have more SMS applications that are able to be parsed. SMS is easy because the government mandates a certain format, so, you know, it essentially is a regex uh, regular expression that you can put onto that data and you can categorize it. Other unstructured uh, information is a little harder to um, categorize. Um, <laughs> UI improvements, or rather a UI, uh, we do not have a UI at this point, uh, obviously, so something interesting can come out of that. We've looked at a couple of libraries. Uh, it all looks very promising. Uh, we definitely need a framework. So the current framework that we have is about six functions that uh, the JavaScript code calls, and um, it basically uh, needs a lot of, you know, iterative cycles, obviously. Um, so this is what needs to happen, and obviously, uh, you know, start, you know that, that needs to happen. So uh, if you've got your QR code enabled fancy phone, Now's the time to take a picture. Um, we're going to have a, a hackathon kind of thing uh, after the event uh, in the banquet hall. 
Um, so if you're interested, come along. If you want to just you know, keep an eye on what's going on, uh, click on that issue and follow it. I'm hoping that people use GitHub. I'm a latecomer to this party, but uh, it looks like it's interesting. Uh, so click on that and you can follow what's going on. Thank you. I've got four minutes for questions, I think. No questions. Okay. How are you running the JavaScript on the Android device? Right. Um, so we we run an open source uh, application library called Rhino, which is developed by the Mozilla Foundation, I believe. Uh, and what it does is it translates on the fly JavaScript, uh, and it's a Java application, so it runs on Android. So, yeah works easily. Now, bear in mind that this application only is for Android at this point, but there's nothing stopping it running on any other frame, uh, mobile phone like the iPhone or Microsoft phone or whatever it is. Uh, we just need the equivalent of a Rhino for that on that pla platform and it'll, it'll, it'll work. Any other questions? Yep. Uh, and uh, and I'm just uh, curious that after a time it is being developed like fully won't this be having the, all the notifications clubbed and again the same problem goes into cycle? Um, so this is why it's important that it's open source because people can pick and choose what, it's a bit like the Play Store if you like, it's a terrible analogy, but uh, you know, where there'll be loads of plugins uh, and you can choose what you like. Um, this particular demo that I showed you does not have the filtering for the notifications uh, because it's a little risky to do that on a on a real application at this point uh, until we figure out how users are interested in uh, you know, the prioritization of notifications. And so you, know, you don't want somebody complaining that they you know, missed something important because of uh, the notification filter. Um, but certainly, um, if you have control over the plugins, and they're all open source, I don't see any reason why they shouldn't be open source, but the framework itself is open, uh, and people can choose. You know, so it's basically a free market of of stuff out there. Um, and what I'm envisioning is something similar to the Arch user repository. I don't know if you've uh, used it, if you're a Linux user, where people just basically bring in all sorts of things and it's rated by user feedback and then the best ones with the best ratings basically uh, you know, are the most popular and used the most. So uh, that's where I'm coming from. Yeah. I hope Thank that you. answers your question. Yeah. Yeah. I think there is a question from around here. Hello. Hello. Uh, how different is the idea from uh, the slice and dice in uh, data analytics, uh, drilling down of information? Data analytics. Do uh, you mean sort of uh, like, like have a lot of data and just filter it down and drill it down? Uh, means how how is this decant very different from that aspect? Decant does not do that for you. Decant provides you with a central framework where different plugin developers can talk to each other. Uh, so if you write a plugin interface that does that, great, you know, it'll work for your data. But until somebody actually writes that plugin, it's not going to happen. Uh, so does that answer your question, more or less? Yeah. Uh, thanks for the question. And one question, what would, suppose, for an end user, how he is going to configure, he need to be a developer or have a basic understanding of JavaScript. So how about coming up with a marketplace for Decant where the developer can push their plugins and the end users can consume it? 
Uh, this is definitely a possibility. Come to the hackathon and we can chat about it. Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> so um, all these are possibilities. I mean, at this point, we've basically just thrown out what we have. Uh, you know, you could probably have a marketplace. You could start your own plugin-based company. I don't know. The possibilities are endless. What I know is that this level of integration uh, is not available on this user interface. I haven't seen it anywhere, and most people that I've spoken to have told me that they haven't seen anything like it. So, you know, normally I would ask for funding and then try and get some money and go away, hide away somewhere and try and make some money. But I'm throwing it out there because that's what Elon Musk does, and I'm a big fan of Elon Musk. So, you know. <laughs> All right, I think I'm out of time, I think. Okay. <laughs>